Well, hey, welcome. Uh, great to see you. My name is Jeff Brody. I'm the lead pastor at Connexus Church, and it's been great to see you jumping online as we begin this conversation about uh, what it means to parent in the midst of COVID-19. So glad that you're joining us. I was just online. I saw Nancy's joining us and Carly is joining us. And uh, I think I saw Julia joining us, Arnie joining us, and a number of you jumping online. And I would encourage you that if you're watching, uh, jump in the chat. This is going to be a great opportunity for uh, a live conversation about what it's like to parent in this unprecedented time. And I think the truth is, um, I've got two kids at home, and uh, my wife Leslie and I, who you're going to meet tonight if you don't know her, uh, we have been really um, trying to figure out what does it mean to parent in the midst of all of this. And I think there's part of us in the midst of it um, that can feel overwhelmed. There's part of us that can feel discouraged. And there's part of us that can think, hey, it's great sometimes to have this extra time with our kids. And so what does this mean? What does this look like? And then there's how do you have a conversation about COVID-19 with your kids? What do you do about screen time? That's a big question for us, homeschooling. And so uh, I really think this is going to be a great opportunity for us to learn. But for those parents out there slugging it out, working hard every day, want you to know we're in your corner and so grateful for what you're doing to uh, to invest in your kids. And so um, we're going to jump in and we're going to meet each of our guests and then we're going to have a live Q&A. So this is what I want to encourage you to do. Uh, our team is in the chat, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. And what they're doing is they're collecting your questions. So you can drop your questions in the chat. And then in addition to that, um, not only can you drop your questions in the chat, but when any of our um, when any of our guest guests, you could say, who are here tonight, join us, what they're going to do is if they if they talk about any specific URLs, resources, um, we're going to drop some links to those in the chat as well. So you drop your questions in, we'll drop the resources in. And, um, and we'll take, we're going to hear a little bit from each guest and then take your questions. So um, I'm going to start with, um, with Rob Meter. And uh, Rob is a great friend. And um, it's great to have you with us, Rob. So great to have you join this group. And Rob, um, you work in pediatrics, specifically really in mental health right now and wellness. Um, and so really glad uh, that you're here and you took the time to join us today. Hey, I'm so glad to be here, Jeff. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor. Now, um, we'll mention again, but just so you know, I'll mention right off the top, Rob and Tony Newhoff, some of you will know her, um, have a podcast called The Smart Family Podcast, and you'll want to check that out. So you're going to hear from Rob tonight, but you can continue to learn through he and his guests on the podcast. Now, uh, mm -hmm. Rob, as you know, uh, maybe better than many of us, it's a unique time. First of all, you're you're helping people with mental illness, specifically um, kids, teenagers, and then um, and your wife Rose is a doctor working on the front lines, which we so appreciate right now. So you're managing it at home. You've got your own kids, and then you're managing at work. So why don't you tell us just a little bit about your family and the ages of your kids? Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, Jeff, I'm a pediatrician. I uh, have a clinic here in Midland, actually, at Waypoint. And uh, my family back home, we've got four kids, uh, and they are uh, ranging in age from 10 to 15 right now, uh, three girls, and then uh, the youngest is a boy, uh, Jacob, and then our three girls, uh, Maddie, Mary, Grace, and Anna. Super proud of them. They are um, weathering this pandemic, this sort of hopefully once in a lifetime experience, right. and uh, we're doing it together as a family. And you're right, Rose is... Uh, on the front lines working in Emerge. And so um, she's got a busy job too. And, and here we are trying to manage it all. So it's a, it certainly is a unique time in our uh, world right now. Right, right. Well, I mean, Rob, I know, I mean, not just what's happening in the world, but what's happening at home and Rose being at the hospital, you're going to be having conversations with your kids about COVID-19. And as a parent, I'm personally trying to figure out like, what do I say? How much do I say? And like, what's age appropriate for, you know, different age levels when they ask questions about COVID-19? Because um, I don't want to put something on my kids that feels like too much, but I don't want to ignore the conversation at the same time. What are your thoughts on having conversations with your kids around COVID-19? 
That's a great question, Jeff, and thanks for asking that. And let me just, you know, first say that, you know, we're, we're going through this pandemic and we're going to see all the, the medical issues and physical issues that are resulting from that. But I think we're going to get a second wave of really the mental health and the societal changes that are going to come out of this. And in fact, that will go on a lot longer. I mean, there's a lot of stress in a lot of families and um, that's uh, gonna be hard for families to navigate. There's gonna be some difficult times for sure. We know that adverse childhood experiences can cause not just mental health issues later on in life in kids, but even physical issues as well. Right. And so I just think it's really important that we start addressing some of these issues in a, in a really intelligent way with our kids. Kudos to all parents out there and all families. I mean, you are going through it, like what I said earlier, a once in a lifetime experience. Uh, we're learning all about homeschooling. We'll hear more about that from Carla in a minute. We're learning all about what it means to be physically distancing. Uh, I like to use that term instead of social distancing. And so this is really a whole new world we're navigating. In many ways, we're going through one big giant societal experiment all together. Right. And, um, so anyway, so how do you talk? Well, first of all, talk to your kids about this uh, to try and ignore it or dismiss it uh, or saying, oh, it's nothing or don't worry about it because we're worried that you know, they may get too worried. That's not the right thing to do. Definitely talk about it. I love the quote from Mr. Rogers. He says, anything that's human is mentionable and anything that's mentionable can be more manageable. Hmm. When we talk about our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less upsetting and less scary. And I think that's a great quote. So talk to your kids about it and how you talk to them about it. I mean, how, how we talk about it and uh, we model for them what we want to see in them. Right. So, you know, the kids will watch how we respond. If we become overly anxious or overly nervous uh, in, in a way that's extreme, that's not helpful. And kids will respond that way as well. And they'll become anxious. We know, we know that kids watch us very carefully. So Jeff, I would say, let kids take the leads. Uh, share age appropriate facts. I mean, you're not gonna tell a four or five year old what you might tell uh, a teenager, for example. A teenager will want many more details to have a much better understanding of what it means to be sick uh, and what it means to, you know, some of these societal changes that we're seeing. A four or five year old may not even really know what's going on. Right. And so you really wanna be careful and say like, there's certain things that are appropriate for this age and certain things that are appropriate for that age. But again, talk about it. Let them take the lead. Let them ask questions. That gives you a good clue about where they're at and provide perspective. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's tempting when you read the news to think like this is the most deadly virus out there. It actually isn't, you know, Ebola is much worse. Right. Uh, you know, and here we are with a, definitely a serious illness, a serious virus. You don't want to understate it either, but you do want to provide perspective and make sure that you're not uh, inaccurate. So get some accurate information out to your kids, you know, uh, um, reassure them that they are safe no matter what. Tell them lots of people are working on this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this everybody is taking this seriously, but no matter what happens, they are safe and you're going to take care of them. And then also, I think lastly, Jeff, I talk about what you can do. OK, when you when you feel out of control, anxiety increases. And we know that that's true for adults and for kids. So it's just so important to talk about what you can do. So you talk about like taking hygiene measures, practicing physical distancing. I mean, when you can talk about it in a positive sort of way like that, that reduces anxiety. It allows feel, kids to feel like they have at least some element of control over this very scary situation that, um, and that, and that can be very reassuring for kids as well. It's, it sounds like there's a balance between informing and striking the balance of you're going to be okay, that, that we're safe on a certain level. Is that kind of what you're saying? Absolutely. And I think we as adults walk that line with our kids. Our leaders are walking that line with our, with our, you know, with our population in general. Um, it, and that's true for everybody. You always want to, you want to be balanced mm -hmm. and um, you don't want to, skirt too much to work towards one extreme or another and finding out that balance what's right for your kids i mean that's where you know your kids the best and you know where that balance is and uh and it's just always so good for us to be looking after our own mental health i don't want to ignore that either as right. parents if we can make sure that you know we are feeling looked after and we are looking after our own mental health getting our sleep diet exercise making sure that all that's in control as much as we can 
um, that's super important as well, because then we are in a good state to look after our kids and strike that balance properly. That's great. That's great. So uh, I, I have a, a personal question, Rob, that uh, my wife, Leslie, and I are talking about often. And I, if we're talking about it, I think a lot of other parents are talking about it. We know that there's a connection between uh, screen time and mental health. I mean, all the reading we see seems that there's some kind of connection there. But now mm. our kids are at school on screens and it seems like, you know, they're talking to grandma and grandpa on screens. There's just an increased amount of screen time. And we're trying to figure out how do you manage screen time? What's appropriate at a time like this? And how do you balance it with other activities? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jeff, what a, what a, what a great question because, you know, just a few months ago before all this was really you know, exploding onto the scene, I was talking about screen time being linked to anxiety and depression and how, you know, it causes kids to be more isolated and not forming social relationships uh, in person like they should. And here we are, now we're relying on screens right. to increase socialization and maintain relationships. And in a way the tables have turned. I think some of us have just thrown up our hands and said, screen time wins. Right. Um, but, you know, I think again, Everything is, should be balanced. I think we should make sure that we keep making time for other non-screen activities. Physical activity is just so important to maintain your own mental health. I mentioned that already. Make sure it does not interfere with sleep time and make sure it does not interfere with just family time. I mean, remember before this pandemic, how, I mean, if you ask any parent, what would you want for your family? They'd say, I wish I could spend more time with my family. Well, be careful what you wish for, because now you've got like all the time in the world to spend <laughs> with your family. And uh, so make sure you use it widely. It is very tempting for us to jump to our screens. And again, just like what I said before, you know, we got a model what we want for our kids to do. So if we're constantly scrolling through our social media feeds, uh, watching the news, and I'm guilty as charged. I mean, for the first few um, days and even a week of this pandemic, as things were really taking off, I was watching the numbers and I was, you know, tracking the statistics. And I and I and I saw my screen time. You know, Apple iPhones they have this screen time thing where they measure how much screen. I just time I, I just ignore that. I I don't pay attention to. <laughs> I was I was through the roof. It was embarrassing to talk about it. How many hours did I spend on my phone? these last few days. Um, so definitely make sure it doesn't interfere with that. The other thing to, that's important, Jeff, is because a lot of kids are now spending educational time on screens. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second as well. But that that, that should not count as, as screen time in a way. We have to make some exceptions during this time. And there's educational screen time, and then there's recreational screen time. I think that's where we need to set some more parameters around. Whenever you're talking about screen time with kids, especially older kids, I always love a collaborative problem solving mm. approach. All right. So that means getting your kids involved in discussion. Hey, how much do you think you need to use your screen? You know, what's a good amount of time per day? You'd be surprised. Usually their answers are very reasonable and realistic. And then, you know, should there be some consequences if we kind of don't adhere to those to those rules that were in guidelines that we're setting for our families? So try and use a collaborative problem solving approach. Um, I mean, I have some other tips and stuff, such I mean, including things like don't use screens in bed or before bedtime. It tends to keep you awake. Mm. Screens and games and such on your phone are more activating and they are relaxing. Right. So it's never a good idea to use a screen before 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 bedtime. Um, and and then use that screen time function for your kids. I mean, if you got an iPhone, you can use a family sharing. And uh, if you're the administrator, you can see how much screen time all your kids have and you can sort of adjust that and set some parameters around kind of what apps can be used when and, and what sort of the time limits are. Again, do that in conjunction with a, a good conversation with your kids so that they can feel somewhat accountable and part of the process of, of solving this, uh, this problem. Yeah, and, th and there's a number of tools out there to do that, whether it's your, you know, the app that you have on your phone that's counting the time. We use uh, Circle by Disney at our house. I think we have the link for that. We can drop in the chat. That's been a good tool for us, but it is a good idea, Rob. I'd never thought of it to work together with our kids on what are the settings on that monitoring device versus, you know, the parent just arbitrarily making the decisions. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. In general, uh, and this is true for any sort of problem solving with kids, unilaterally imposed 
solutions on kids rarely stick. Mm. If you can get kids to be involved with, with coming up with solutions, um, they're going to be more accountable to it. They're going to feel some ownership to it. And you'd be surprised. They're much more likely to follow the guidelines that they have helped set. And plus, isn't that how we want kids to, to function in the adult world eventually? So what great time to practice it than now with our kids when we just have these issues come up in our family life. Okay, that's great. So, uh, Rob, we're going to come back to you on the panel, but if you've got questions, don't forget to uh, put them in the chat and we're going to get to those. And then uh, I'm going to introduce... Uh, I'm going to introduce my favorite guest. I'm a little bit biased. Um, my wife, Leslie, uh, and right now my hairdresser, my barber. Um, and so uh, my wife, Leslie, has been, I was trying to think the other day how long you've been a teacher, like a guidance counselor. How long has that been? Oh, uh, I think about 25 years. Okay. Something like that. Wow. So that's how we met. Uh, I was a high school teacher at one point. Uh, Leslie is an incredible guidance counselor. She leads a uh, student services department at um, a very highly regarded high school and has been doing it for years. And now she's doing it at our house um, as she's working mm -hmm. from home. And uh, we've also got a, a grade nine student and a grade six student, uh, Carter and Gavin at our house. We're trying to figure out online schooling with them as well as uh, she's helping a lot of parents and spending a lot of time on the phone with parents these days and for the the people who kind of have teenagers in particular out there uh leslie i know <clears throat> you're getting questions from parents around this sort of online teaching seems like a great solution but it doesn't feel like it's working for every student um mm -hmm. it's not like everybody isn't self-motivated um, not everybody has all the supports in place so for example if you have a student that has supports at the school and now they don't have those supports. What does that mean? Socially, uh, they don't have access to their friends. For, for some, for some uh, teenagers, that's going to be a really difficult thing. What's the kind of advice that you're getting, you're giving, and uh, to parents who are calling about these specific issues? Yeah, no, that's, uh, we're all facing the similar types of situation, but you know, our kids are all wired differently and uh, learning how to help each one of them navigate through this situation is, is an ongoing um, reality. Um, the first thing that I would say to them is just recognize that students need to be able to mourn um, the things that they are losing, the things that they've lost. Um, don't minimize uh, what, they're, what they're missing out on in these in these times, you know, things like relationships, it, it could be friendships, it could be, you know, the young puppy love stuff of high school that, you know, might not seem that important to us, but for them, it's the everything. Um, things like graduation and prom for our senior students, it's just a real loss that they're facing. And so allowing students to process that, to mourn that, uh, even sports seasons, all sorts of things that, that are just no longer part of their high school reality. Um, and that that's a real challenge uh, for a lot of our students. Um, the, the next thing I would say to them is it's, it's helpful to create a sense of structure, create a sense of uh, predictability, but with flexibility. Uh, what we're recognizing with remote learning, that's how we're calling it at our school, because online learning is different um, than what we're doing in this, uh, this different So what's the, so what's the difference there? Why the nuance? Yeah, I think the idea with online learning, um, you, you, it is developed that way. The curriculum is developed to be delivered online only and for the student to work independently towards the, the completion of that course. Whereas what we're doing is sort of taking a, a robust, you know, classroom experience and trying to put it into a Zoom call and it just feels different. Um, teachers are having to redesign and redevelop things that they've established and uh, that just takes time and we're finding the same thing with students uh, so we've sort of said to all of our teachers and, and families we need to recognize that this work may take almost twice as long as it would in the regular classroom so plan for that uh, you know you, you can't deliver say an 80 minute lesson and then expect an hour of homework at night for every classroom that they're in uh, it's just not realistic and it can overwhelm and really affect the wellness of our students. So uh, setting a structure, 
um, getting dressed, getting up, getting dressed, follow, follow the regular pattern of your school day is healthy and helpful, but also create some flexibility within that structure to allow for the extra time that's needed to complete the tasks that are, that are assigned. It's also so important to take breaks, you know, build that into your schedule with your flexibility because students do need that sense of, um, you know, different variations. We call it uh, different modalities. So they're learning in front of a computer so much these days. And our teachers are even saying, okay, within my lesson, I'm having them get up and walk around in their, wherever they're, they're watching just because they're, they're not able to move around in the same ways that they are in the typical school day. Um, the other thing that um, is so important for all of our students and families is to take care of yourself, but do it in all of the ways. So uh, take care of yourself socially. Make sure that you're engaging with your friends, that you're connecting, that you're, that you're staying uh, involved uh, with people who you care about. Um, take care of yourself emotionally. Do the things that you love. Uh, pick up something new. Try something different. Just engage in something that brings you joy. Um, make sure that you're taking care of yourself physically, as uh, Rob mentioned, the idea of the things like uh, proper eating, sleeping, and physical activity are sort of the first things to go out the door when we're in a difficult situation, but they now more than ever are so important uh, to be mindful of. Uh, but also spiritually, take care of yourself uh, spiritually as well. Um, spend time in prayer, spend time in worship, spend time uh, connecting to the word and just really focusing in on all aspects of yourself. Um, as a teenager, you know, you, you can get drawn in so many different ways, but if they can continue to center themselves in those things, it helps them face the daily tasks that can feel overwhelming when they're, when they can feel on their own. Yeah. What I'm hearing there is uh, routine is important. I, I think mm -hmm. we can get into like, well, it's, it's just an extended March break and all of our <laughs> our break habits become our life habits. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. getting up, getting dressed, having a routine, picking up new skills, getting breaks, getting outside, all of those things are, mm -hmm. I think, key to, to health. Because I think you're right, there's a part of it that it's it's just not the same as school in some cases, no. and making no. sure we're treating that way. Okay, we're gonna come back to questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm gonna introduce Carla Brubaker. And um, Carla's worked in linguistics um and in the past and now homeschools uh her four girls and they're if you've never had a chance to meet them they're fantastic people and uh carla why don't you kind of give us the age spread of your kids and uh, maybe first names if that's okay sure i have uh twin 13 year old girls julia and kelsey i have a 10 year old girl lauren and six year old emma that's great. And um, Carla's married to Dan, who's on our staff, does a great job with us. Now, Carla, you've um, you've been how long have you been homeschooling for since since they were early on or just recently? Yeah, the, the twins went to school in JK, but I've taught them from uh, senior kindergarten on. Right. So Carla's yeah. been doing the homeschool thing for her. Nothing's changed on the school front um, in some <laughs> in some regard, uh, although yeah. I know there's a lot of other social things that go on. But Yes. I, I would love to just hear, hey, I, I'm, I'm talking to parents who are going, I don't know what to do. Like, um, where do I begin? For a while, the schools maybe weren't providing anything. Now they're providing something. I'm not sure if it's enough. And I thought, man, it would be great to get Carla on here to just share some of her tips on like homeschooling your kids. So what are kind of your top tips for people, things that you've done that have worked well? Okay. Well, I'm just going to talk generally because sure. there is so many ways that you could go, so much advice you could give depending on the um, family situation, how many kids and whatnot, but I'm just gonna to speak generally. But um, basically what is happening right now in homes is, is not what I would call homeschooling. Right. Um, homeschooling is um, for, for me, the parents are beginning right now in spring to, to plan for next year. And whatnot. This is a this is a crisis situation, right. and parents have been put into a, a situation that they didn't choose. They didn't um, pick it. They didn't pick the curriculum. It just kind of landed on their um, laps. And so this is um, a difficult situation. This is a difficult time. And I would um, I would say my first <laughs> bit of advice is just give yourself some grace. Mm -hmm. This is, a, it, it's a hard time and um, 
you weren't prepared for it. And uh, it, it's very, it's just very difficult. But these days have also the potential to be the best days of your family's lives. Mm -hmm. You have the opportunity to spend more time with your kids than you were um, at the beginning of the year. And, uh, you know, they can be very, very special times. Mm -hmm. You give yourself grace when you don't know how to do the, use the computer, um, when you don't know how to um, do a math problem. Algebra comes up and you're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Give yourself some grace. It's okay. From what I've been hearing, the schools have been really amazing in what they're really expecting. And I, I don't feel like there's... Um, they're being really strict on, you've got to get this done. You've got to right. have it perfectly done. So give yourself um, some grace. Mm -hmm. And along, along the same lines is kind of set the mood in your house. Right. And uh, Rob already mentioned this, but the mood that you bring to the house, if you're stressed or if you're anxious, the kids are going to pick up on that. Right. And they're, you know, you're kind of setting your day off on a bad note if you're anxious or you're uptight. So I would just I would just say, focus on that. Be um, aware of how you're coming across to your kids, and um, if you're not in a good mindset, then I would just set school aside for a day or two or however long you need, and and spend time with your kids, and and you be the student, and you get to know your kids again. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's um, interesting, Carla. I think. If your kids are in a in a school setting, you're used to this like, well, it's got to go nine to three thirty. Mm -hmm. But your experience would be, you, you know, your experience would say, no, it doesn't actually have to be that. There's a lot more flex in the day than you might think, right? Mm hmm. And there's just the freedom to be able to do, kind of, you can sense what your your is going on in your family. If your kids are having a bad um, day, or if you're having a bad day, hey, let's just change the day up a little bit, and you'd be amazed. What you can learn by um, taking the kids out on a nature walk, mm -hmm. baking with the kids. Um, you can learn a lot just by doing things like that. Um, That's so great. If you're, in, if you're in the right mindset and if you're giving yourself grace, then I would say my third piece of advice would just be to set um, a schedule, set um, what your day is going to look like. And Leslie, I already mentioned that. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was great. Um, so basically, if the kids know what to expect um, from day to day, they're just more comfortable. They're feeling good about themselves. I know that this is happening and this is what's happening next. They're calmer and they will um, excel in that kind of situation. So um, I don't know if you want to wait for question time for me to kind of ex say what my... Um, schedule is like around our house. Yeah, give me or... the quick rundown. Of, like, give me the quick rundown. Sure. Quick rundown. We'll just kids wake up in the morning, as Leslie said, just do do the things that you normally would get dressed, you know, brush your teeth, make your bed, do all those things. Hey, if I haven't accomplished anything, I've made my bed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have done some of these things and um, do the, the morning chores and piano practicing, whatever. Uh, one thing that I do a little bit differently in my house, because we can, is a nine, at nine o'clock, we've just chosen that time. I stop everybody and we all go to the couches and I read a book okay and I kind of feel like when you wake up in the morning everybody is just going whichever way and it's kind of crazy in the home but at nine o'clock we slow and it gives everybody we're kind of all starting at the um, starting line again and it slows everybody gets everybody in a better mindset and uh we just have a reading time mm -hmm. and I've chosen the book based on my loves. And, uh, it's also a really good time for discussion. And as, as Rob was saying, just, you know, having these discussion, um, times with your kids is very, very valuable mm -hmm. and lots of things can come out of story time. Um, and then we start our school. One thing I would say about starting school is do the hard thing first. Okay. That's good. So if math is hard, do it first. And then you'll be able to enjoy the rest of the day. Okay. Um, take break times. I think Leslie said that. Maybe go out for a run. If one parent's helping with schooling, get the other parent to, hey, you're the gym teacher. Let's go for a little game of soccer or run around the block, whatever right. it may be. Um, 
lunchtime. Another thing that we do in this house is we have quiet time. And this is also known as sanity time. Yeah, really. And I think that if parents <laughs> allowed themselves to say, hey, between one and two or between one and three, whatever it may be, um, hey, we're going to have a quiet time and this is going to be our time for reading and um, or whatever it may be. Uh, but it's it's a quiet time. It's really, in, in all honesty, it's my time for nobody to be talking to me so I can um, care for myself. Right. <laughs> yeah. And um, in our in our house, three to five is outside playing. Right. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Okay, really good. So now we're going to open it up for questions. Kind of got to run down there. So uh, we're going to move over here. And Jen's with us, uh, who serves on staff with me, does a great job. Jen, what questions do you, do you have there from uh, the Q&A? And if you've got other questions, let us know. Um, yeah, so there's lots of great questions. <laughs> um, the first one, we'll start off with, um, this one was actually a specific question for Rob, and it says, uh, what are your thoughts on video games specifically? Is there an ideal time for how many hours per week? Is it better just to not play video games at all? Um, are there specific games that we should avoid so they don't become desensitized to things like violence, all that kind of stuff? All right, Rob, you're up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, should we do an entire episode just on video <laughs> games? <laughs> uh, obviously, there is. A, I mean, there's a whole range of answers uh, depending on you know what you're talking about and uh, what kind of games you're talking about and what age the kids are. Um, but really, of course, video games generally fall into the entertainment category. I mean, there are some educational games out there, but I think we're talking about the entertainment type games. Um, you know, there's there's literature on that about you know whether that can lead to violence if they're violent games, etc. And um, you know, it's actually the, the link there is actually not that clear. But having said that, you know, we have to be careful with young kids, especially being exposed to graphic images and games that are not appropriate for their age. Uh, all video games come with ratings, and you know, even those ratings I find sometimes are, you know, a little bit on the lenient side. And so as a parent, I would just be careful about certain games that are overly graphic or, or might contain certain images that's not appropriate for, for kids. Um, and so I would also say, again, this is, the, this is the entertainment side of things, so it shouldn't interfere with other things at home, like family time, like meal times. Um, and this should be something that you should solve collaboratively with your child by like, well, what, what is an appropriate amount of time? and kind of uh, come to a consensus about how much and when the video game should be played. In general, around our house, you know, uh, early morning, you know, when you jump out of bed, that's not the time to play a video game. You know, you got to get your routines going. Um, as Carla was saying, do the hard things first. So, you know, if you're gonna do some schooling at home, that be the time to do it. Um, and the afternoons might be more kind of downtime Generally, when our mental energy starts to go down, that's the time to maybe get outside, do some playing. But for some kids, if that's screen time just for fun, then great. If you've come to a conclusion about this is a good amount of time that we should maybe spend on just playing kind of mindless games, that's okay too. I mean, again, give yourself some grace during this time. If your kids need to spend a little bit of time just doing something mindless, that so be it. Okay, give yourself that latitude at this sort of a unique time. But again, just make sure it's age appropriate. I prefer really games with little to no violence. Um, and I, I watch that carefully in my kids. Uh, we At our house, we don't actually even have an Xbox or a um, Nintendo or anything like that. So we've managed to avoid it thus far. But you know, I do get my share of Roblox and Minecraft type uh, requests on my phone. So again, whenever our kids want to download games, it, it, go, it, it flows through my phone, so I have to, to approve it. Uh, that might seem like extreme measures, but I mean, I think that's just what is good for kind of family function. Know what your kids are doing. And, and here's another thing. When they're playing those games, um, either play with them or ask them about it. You know, talk to them about it. Say like, hey, how do you get a high score in this game? Or like, what's that, you know, funny character over there? Um, and, you know, that, that just, uh, you know, reduces sort of the guilt uh, that sometimes is associated with just playing video games. Even as adults, we do mindless things that really don't mean anything. And kids 
should have the ability to do that too every once in a while, just to kind of shut off and tune out and just do something just for fun. Great. That's great. Thanks, Rob. You got another question there, Jen? Uh, yeah. Um, so this one is from um, a mom named Melissa. She says, how do we approach our little one's emotions? My daughter is three and not understanding physical distancing. She misses her cousins, friends, church. Um, she's asking the same questions and it makes parenting really hard. Mm. I might throw that one to you again, Rob, if you don't mind. Yeah, so here, you know, we talk about uh, what is developmentally appropriate. You know, kids at the age of three have, uh, they have strong emotions. We know that. Um, and how they express that is, um, is uh, pretty obvious. Sometimes, you know, we talk about temper tantrums and, and kids getting upset pretty easily. Things escalate quite quickly. Emotional self-regulation is just starting to develop. Um, you know, notions of empathy and kind of understanding such concepts as sickness and and dying i mean those are just things that are just starting to develop so being aware of that as a parent uh, is is kind of important so you want to use very simple language you know kids might understand things like germs instead of viruses and bacteria and um, they'll certainly understand concepts like you know washing your hands can keep the germs out of your body um, and that you know um, when you're sick you have to go to the hospital um, and then you can talk about germs too, like how, how they spread. So coughing spreads germs. So you want to be careful you don't cough on someone because, you know, those things kind of come out of your mouth and can land on somebody else and you can spread your germs that way. So I think a lot of kids know the concept of germs and cooties and all that kind of stuff. So you can use whatever language or words uh, your, your kids are using at school or with their peers and just kind of capitalize on that and use that uh, for your explanation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's a tough age. I mean, they're just, you know, at age three, they're kind of barely verbal and they're just, they're just starting to learn language. And so as a, as a parent, we got to just come down to their level and uh, connect with them emotionally. I mean, if they're, if they're anxious and kids will like at that age will express anxiety and in, in, I mean, different ways. I mean, oftentimes it's irritability. They can withdraw. Um, it's not the same way that we adults express anxiety. And, um, you know, sometimes we have to be just a bit more aware that when kids just don't feel like doing something or they're quiet. Um, some kids, when they're a bit older, they'll, they'll maybe joke inappropriately or kind of pretend something is funny. And you realize, oh, there's something deeper underlying this, mm -hmm. this sort of uh, dissociation from reality. And so uh, that's, again, it's something for parents to try and clue in on. It's like, what's really going on here? What are these emotions really about? Um, why are you not want to do things that you normally would want to do? Uh, and let's talk about it. And yeah, as you said earlier, the balance of uh, not freaking out. Like we had a situation a number of weeks ago, early on in COVID, where our kids were talking about, oh, we ran into another kid at the park and we were playing with them. And, you know, on the inside, I was like, oh my gosh, like they should be doing that. And I'm starting to freak out, you know, but what I'm actually doing is just making the situation worse, not making the situation better. Um, yes. You know, stay calm. Everything's under control. Right. You know, just kind of just being uh, just being realistic in that situation. I mean, we're never going to be 100 percent perfect when we're even as we start to loosen some restrictions, you know, we're, we're going to make some mistakes and, you know, and that's what we have to keep an eye on. But, you know, don't. Uh, don't uh, kick yourself too hard because you know you've uh, you've let something slip or you've um, reacted in a certain way or done something that's uh, oh, that's not the public health guidelines, you know. But try to follow everything, of course, as best as you can. Be careful, uh, especially for our vulnerable populations that are out there. Great, Jen, you got another one there. Yeah. Um... So this one is, um, this one actually came out of when you were talking, Leslie, um, and it says, I'd love to hear more about helping our kids grieve. Um, mm. We have some sad and lonely kids. Um, and for some of them, they're sharing it's a new thing for their kids. Some of it, it's been mm. ongoing. Um, and what do they, these parents do when their company isn't enough and they just want to see friends or grandparents or family members? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so common. So know that firstly, you're not alone in that. Um, every teenager is experiencing some form of loss. And 
sort of like the toddlers, sometimes it's hard for them to express those feelings in, uh, in ways that help us understand what they're really going through. Sometimes the grief does look like irritability or frustration or, you know, a flying off the handle about something when, when you really start to unpack it further, you recognize, no, it is really just more that uh, they're struggling with their emotions and, um, you know, how to cope with that. So, so the first thing is, um, is just allowing uh, them to talk. But listening maybe in the moments when they're not actually saying the words, I'm sad. Um, so just allowing in just your, your day-to-day conversations with your teenager to recognize um, just opportunities to ask another question, to, to listen a little bit more uh, for something that uh, they may be not willing to say, but uh, that they're feeling. So uh, lots and lots of listening, I think, is really key. Um, sometimes teenagers don't know, um, we think they're social beings and that they're good with all this social media or, you know, whatever they, whatever they need to connect with their friends, but some, some just aren't, uh, in the same way that others are. So, um, sometimes they might need some coaching on, um, Hey, why don't you, um, pick up the phone and which is very foreign to many teenagers (laughs) these days, but pick up the phone and call that friend or, um, why don't we, um, I've used the, uh, the idea of uh, let's, let's give grandma a call on Zoom and make them think it's about grandma, but sometimes it's about them too and being able to uh, really connect with, you know, cousins, grandparents, whoever it is that they're, uh, that they're missing seeing and that goes with their friends as well. Uh, so sometimes they, they may need a little prompt where we wouldn't think that to be the case for teenagers. Sometimes they really do need our help to, um, to take that first step and maybe to take a second step um, after that, uh, it just can be um, sometimes feel overwhelming um, for them to, to do those things that we think might be pretty easy for them. Mm-hmm. One, th- one thing I've learned from Leslie is just because uh, somebody n- knows, just because a student knows how to text or use social media doesn't mean they know how to be social. Um, mm-hmm. It's not the same thing. And so coaching kids to kind of communicate is important. That's great. Thanks, Leslie. Jen, what else you got? Um, so this one has been repeated by a few people. So as more and more parents are now also trying to learn what working from home looks like, um, do you have any advice for parents who are quickly adjusting to working from home while also helping their kids adjust to remote schooling? I, I don't um, I mean, I think for it's kind of a mix for all of us. Maybe we'll a couple of us will tackle that one. Maybe Carla, we'll start with you. Dan was working more from the office now is working more from home has that changed a little bit as to kind of how you approach things or things kind of the same as they were yeah to be honest things are pretty much the same with him being home other than he's here for breakfast and lunch (laughs) as well but um just having that i've thought this through because my heart goes out to all these parents that are working from home and and trying to figure out how to do it and um you know, I, I mentioned a schedule and having a schedule and, and giving the, the time to the kids at the beginning and getting through the things that they need to get done from the beginning. Um, and then putting into your schedule, okay, this is now mommy time or this is now daddy time. Mommy needs to do to uh, work from these hours. If the kids understand that at the very beginning of the day, they're going to be a lot more understanding than if it, you're shoving them aside. So I think if, if you can, you know, toss things back and forth between mom and dad, if there is a mom and a dad in the home, um, it's going to, and you plan it from the very beginning. That's uh, one way that you could make it work. Yeah. I like the idea of allotting a time of not just when they're working, but when you're working, one mm-hmm. of my hardest things as a parent I think is that my kids can't distinguish when I'm on the phone for recreation or when I'm on the phone for work or when I'm on the computer for recreation. Or when And now for the first time in my life, I know how it feels because I'm having the same experience with them. Are you on the computer for school? Or are you on the computer for recreation? And I'm realizing that it's really hard to, to, you know, to distinguish that. So I like that idea of allotting, hey, this is actually when I'm working and when I'm not working. I think that's mm-hmm. good. Other thoughts on the working from home piece anybody has? You can jump in. 
I was going to um, say, what is it? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, Nestle. Go ahead, Carla. Go ahead, Carla. I was just going to say a few ideas for, for different ages. If you know you've got an important phone call coming up, um, some ideas for little ones is to take their favorite toy um, and make sure you've got their favorite toys kind of almost hidden away. And when you know this important call is coming, bring the toy down. Okay, it's time to play with this toy. Mm -hmm. And, or maybe it's a blanket with Lego on it. And you know that they'll be entertained for a good chunk of time. That's something you can do. Or um, brainstorm ahead of time for a little bit older kids so that you have an activity that you know for this one hour, they are not going to interrupt me for sure. Right. And and just have those sorts of things available. I love that. It's like your secret weapon, right? It's like, okay, yeah. I know I'm giving them a half an hour of Paw Patrol today and I'm gonna use yeah. it wisely. Uh, yes. So, so that's, that's really good. <laughs> Leslie, you're gonna say something? Yeah, uh, as far as uh, the way we've set things up is all four of us have our own workstations and um, our workstations are, you know, I'm in, the, I'm in the dining room and so is one of my, our younger son and our older son is in the kitchen. But from where I sit, I can see both of them uh, at the same time. And so we've developed this sort of system where we know when uh, Gavin's on a Zoom call and we know at what time Carter has his call and I'll give the signal when I'm going. So it just helps to communicate that we're all in a similar space, but we do, we have carved out our own um, areas to work and that's been helpful. It is more challenging if you're all sharing a device, for example, for your schoolwork or for uh, the things that you need to do. So then like Carla's saying, a schedule to understand who needs what at what time um, is critical. It's just essential to be able to have things work uh, and move along smoothly through the day. If you have younger kids, your, your time that you're able to work sometimes will be much shorter. You'll get shorter bursts of times that you can work. Uh, with our kids are a little bit older, I can carve out a, a little bit more time uh, each time. Um, but just recognize that. Recognize that at the age they are, uh, they may need more of you. Uh, and then uh, just work to navigate that with the work responsibilities as well. Mm -hmm. Some of the people I work with, unfortunately, are are uh, putting the child to bed and getting down to work at 9 p.m. for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so this season, sometimes that mm -hmm. uh, just the, the steps that have to be taken to ensure you can get done what you need to. Yeah. And depending on the age of your kids, I think sometimes you can if you've normally leveraged grandparents, you can mm -hmm. feel like that's not an option anymore. Um, yeah. But like my mom's decided to like, she creates little assignments, like a little research assignment and sends it to the kids and they have to email her back. Um, getting your, your mom or dad to read a story over Zoom, like all these little things maybe can buy you 15, 30 minutes that maybe you wouldn't normally, normally have. So those are a few options. Jen, other questions? Uh, yes, so uh, any advice, this one can just be open, any advice for parents that are dealing with kids who have ADHD, ADD, autism, et cetera, especially if they're trying to school more than one child. Okay, so I know that Rob has some stuff on this, resources, et cetera, as well. So I'm gonna give that to you, Rob. Yeah, and um, I, I know Jeff, I did forward some links and if you could post those for people, there are, there are some good organizations out there that have some really good advice specifically for that. But I can I could tell you a couple of things just right off the bat, and this has been brought up by by Carla and by Leslie and by yourself too, mm -hmm. is routine, 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 right? Because that if you can kind of get a routine going, when we first started out with this lockdown, it was kind of like every day was a Saturday, and I've been telling parents, hey, start making every day more like a Tuesday, all right? <laughs> so pretend it's a school day, get up brush your teeth, have breakfast, you know, get dressed or whatever order you normally do it in because, you know, kids were sleeping in pretty well every day. And it was March break, remember when kind of schools oh. closed down. And so we all had good March break, but after March break, we're like, hey, we got to get down to a routine. Remember routines and doing things in a predictable way reduces anxiety. I mean, if you can kind of know what's going to come up, that actually reduces anxiety. Again, when we feel like we're in control, anxiety tends to be reduced. Now, of course, that's not possible all the time. But kind of try and establish that kind of routine with your kids, uh, especially kids with ADHD, with autism, especially, right? So autism, kids with autism, they kind of like to know what's coming up. They 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 can sometimes be anxious, um, and so if they're sort of uh, aware of what the schedule is for the day, maybe going over that at the beginning of the day 
would be really useful for them. Uh, again, it's hard to provide sort of a, a general answer because there can be such a spectrum of presentations of things like autism and of ADHD, but just those two things are really important. And then lastly, I'm just going to say physical activity. Um, so if you're just spending the whole day trying to do schoolwork, good luck. It's not going to work. You know, do it for a, a time in a day that makes sense for your child and you, you can kind of figure that out pretty quickly. Uh, but then make sure they get outside every day. All right. Make, uh, at the beginning of this, um, this lockdown, you know, I said school might be canceled, but the, uh, the great outdoors is not. And mm -hmm. I know in some countries it is actually. So I just want to, you know, throw that out there too. But for now, I mean, kids can still go out for a walk. You can, you can still go walk down the street, uh, make sure you keep that physical distance. Um, even, you know, running around in the field, again, just kind of being aware of what the regulations are, but trying to kind of keep kids active, I think is really important, especially kids with ADHD who just kind of, they need to burn off that energy. And in a way they have more flexibility now with that than they did at school. So, um, you know, so as a, take advantage of that as a parent mm -hmm. uh, and say, okay, let's take a five minute break. Um, you know, we'll work on the schoolwork for 10 minutes. And I think as Leslie said already, doing work like that, like virtual or, or, or this e-learning e, e is actually much more mentally taxing than uh, it is to sit in a regular classroom. Even I need to take breaks uh, quite a bit more often in my office because I'm doing a lot of um, uh, telemedicine right now. It's just much more mentally draining. So take breaks, take breaks, get some exercise, move around. Uh, kids love that. Uh, they, they need to move around to stay focused. Great, great. That's great. Jen, you got one more? Um, sure. This last one, there's, there's lots more. Um, we'll go with, uh, do you have any advice for single parents who have their kids solely on their own right now? Great. It doesn't say the ages, does it at all? Um, this has come up in a couple different. So some have younger kids, some have elementary kids. So, so, so between preschool and elementary. So maybe we'll give that, we'll give it to Leslie and Carla. So we'll start with Leslie sort of on, the, um, and kind of see where we land between the two. Yeah, I th it's, uh, first just recognize that you're dealing with an extra level of complexity as, you know, Carla mentioned the idea of spelling each other off, you know, I'll take this, you take that. Um, that doesn't, you know, happen uh, when you're working at it on your own. So uh, the first thing is, as before, give yourself some grace to recognize that um, you're trying to do it all. You're trying to parent, you're trying to be the the cook, the, you know, the educator, all of those things all wrapped up in one. Um, I th to me, the first and foremost thing is to remember that the wellness of your child is, is the, the most important thing for them. Uh, yes, the school is important. The things that they need to learn are, are, are part of their development, but this is a crisis season and um, you don't need to necessarily expect yourself to check every curriculum box um, before they go back uh, to school. Uh, so recognize that it's okay if some things don't get covered. Um, recognize that it's okay if today the kitchen got cleaned and you know maybe tomorrow I'll work on preparing a nice meal. But today the focus was just you know hugging and loving on my kids. And so hot dogs. I think and a, hot dogs a, in a the help, microwave. Listen, craft dinner, whatever. <laughs> it does, it's all okay. <laughs> Um, so just recognize um, that you also need to take care of yourself uh, if you are working at a lot of things uh, where it could be your job and um, parenting and educating your kids. Uh, all of that um, is a lot for you as well. So recognize that that you need those those quiet spaces, quiet times for yourself to recharge, because when you are at your best, that's when you can give your best. And if you're too depleted, then. Um, it's hard to uh, to give your best. So I think that's really important as well. Carla, uh, I know Leslie said a lot there. Is there anything you had to add to that? Oh, I thought that was an excellent answer. Um, I, yeah, it's hard to say depending on the ages of the kids, mm. but even just, you know, I'm, I'm in my mind picturing um, some little kids, you know, taking, taking the kids outside. And if one of them's in grade one or grade two learning, addition facts, they can write those on the on the driveway with chalk, while the other one's running around and, and playing and having fun. Like, I'm just trying to think of ways as, 
um, one parent can can try to have a few kids and and do um, whatever they're needing to do. Right. But I think the main thing is to give yourself some grace and understand that you know the what the ask has been pretty big right right <laughs> these parents now Carla I, I'm gonna put you on the spot with a question but yeah. I think I yeah. think you'll know the answer so I would love to know as we kind of wrap up here spiritually as we walk mm-hmm. with kids during this time I'm a big fan of bedtime spiritually or set aside time spiritually it can be for us it's bedtime it could be mm-hmm. other times what has been your routine with your girls at the kind of when they were younger or kind of now at this age just from a spiritual standpoint as we walk with our kids. Mm-hmm. So actually, I, I didn't mention this before, but um, during the reading time that I talked about, the kind of the first thing where we stop and, and are starting on the, the starting blocks, um, the beginning of the day is um, our time to read and to um, talk about the Lord and what um, he means to us and what uh, uh, how we can use God's word to help impact our days Mm -hmm. and the decisions that we make, the way that we respond. And, um, that's a huge part of our day brings about a lot of discussion. And we, we do, um, at the end of that time, just start our day off with prayer, acknowledging that we cannot do this on our own. We need help. Um, all of this is impossible, whether we're going through COVID-19 or not, mm-hmm. um, day to day. So I love it. that is one of the big things that, that we do in our home. Yeah, I like this set aside morning or evening or both, even a few mm-hmm. minutes just to pray with your kids or mm-hmm. being conscientious about praying at a meal and, and something. And if you've never done it before, just saying it how, you know, just how you would talk to someone and, and talk to God. I think it it models something for kids. And um Danelle, if you want to put up, I would love at some point, Danelle will put up uh, a URL where you can get some of our family ministry resources from Connexus. And they might be helpful to you to get a break, or uh, they might be helpful to you in walking with your kids spiritually. I think both those things. But I, I just want to thank all of you guys for um, for the time that you've spent with us. And as Rob said, it's taxing to be on screens all day long, and you've given <laughs> you've given extra time to do that. So... Uh, just thanks so much. Thanks so much for, for your time with us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I want to mention a couple of things f- to you. First of all, that family ministry resources that we've shared with you as well. We would love to see you on Sunday. We're in part two of a, a series in our services where I'm sharing about hearing from God. It's going to be a great Sunday this Sunday, 9, 10, 30, noon, and 1, 30, and 7 p.m. on Sunday we have services. Hey, and if you're looking for community and some people to connect with, we've got groups that connect for six weeks, and we've got a couple more of those kicking off. They're almost uh, they're almost full, but really a small group opportunity for you to connect with some people on Zoom um, every week for the next six weeks to build some community together and um, we would love to connect you in that way. So thank you so much for being with us. I want to let you know this is going to be on demand. So share it with a friend, a family member, anybody you think it would be useful to. And thanks so much for being with us. And uh, we're cheering you on, all you parents out there. Give yourself some grace. <laughs>